Um, hi everyone, so we're ready to start the next talk and I'm very happy to introduce Rachel who's talking to us about um, making fashion technology and human organs. I misread it the first time and I thought it was making it out of human organs but it's not. So um, anyway, over to you Rachel. Thank you. Yes. Hello everyone, sorry about the technical delay. Um, Okay, uh, so today I decided to talk about what it's like making, um, well, as you guys are very familiar with the internet, making in the age of the internet. Um, and to begin, I'm just gonna introduce myself. Uh, I am, my name is Rachel, um, and I am known as Konnichiwa Kitty, which is also the branding for my fashion tech. I am a maker, hacker, um, fashion tech engineer, stem cell scientist, as well as a mental health advocate. Um, <laughs> um, so why am I speaking today? Um, I'd like to talk to you about um, making wearables. What are they and why I'm making wearables in terms of fashion technology? Um, I'd also like to scare you or give you a view into the future of medicine using tissue engineering, which is the creation of human organs. And lastly, just to share my experiences in doing both these things. So first of all, making wearable fashion technology. Um, the reason why I've designed this presentation in a way that you know, um, on how to get started is because I often get a lot of questions from people um, asking how do you get into it, you know, especially since I'm actually doing something completely different, which is stem cell research. So first of all, what is wearable technology? Wearable technology is a blanket term for electronics that can be worn on the body, either as an accessory or part of material used in clothing. This means that it can be accessories that are specifically designed to fit on your body or um, some sort of electronics attached to textile, which um, acts as a carrier for these electronics. So, um, wearable tech can be categorized into two main categories, namely health tech, which a lot of us know of, um, and fashion technology. So, um, health tech products are such as fitness trackers, uh, which helps you to keep track of your number of steps, how many steps you climb, how many calories you burn, your heart rate, and also like it provides all your information and connect it to the internet so you can find out more about it. Fashion tech, on the other hand, um, includes clothing with expressions. Fashion tech doesn't believe in attaching a um, mobile phone or a laptop to your body because at the end of the day, you're still gonna wanna use your laptop, you're still gonna wanna use your phones for ease of accessibility. Fashion tech believes in creating a second skin in terms of enhancing uh, an, a user's experience. So some examples of fashion tech includes um, clothing that can reflect your mood or it can enhance your experience if you are wearing it in a theater and it sends vibrations to your bodies. I've selected, I've, <laughs> okay, well, I've decided to try fashion tech rather than um, health tech in terms of wearables because I believe that fashion tech is a lot more relatable to a lot of people in the sense that with health tech, you have to understand what the information provided to you mean. So you actually need to put an effort to understand um, the, the information that's provided. On the other hand, with fashion tech, every day you have to make a conscious fashion decision. You wake up in the morning and you think to yourself, am I gonna wear this t-shirt or that t-shirt? Will this trousers or skirt go with this top or not? So it relates to everyone. So here I'm gonna show an example of um, some of my personal fashion tech projects. This is a floral necklace made with neo pixel rings and controlled by the Raspberry Pi and the Raspi O hat. Will it play? Okay, yeah. So um, the purpose of this is really just to express myself. Why should I wear a basic chunky necklace when I can do something like this that 
not only expresses myself, but creates a lot of interest, a lot of discussion, and um, also encourages other people to try to do more with their accessories. Following that, another um, project that I've made. Uh, so this is one of the first uh, accessories that I've made. It uses, again, a Rasp Raspberry Pi Zero and a unicorn uh, hat. And the purpose of this is, again, to have fun, to express myself. And also, this has encouraged a lot of people who like, I, I want to say girls or women, but there are a lot of people other than girls or women specifically who like this kind of aesthetic and it encourages them to try electronics or basic programming. So how to get started? Again, a lot of people um, ask how do I get started with making this when I show my pieces at exhibitions. So first of all, the first thing that's really, really important to get into making or just learning a new skill is to be inspired. So when I look for inspiration, you know, I did a little bit of a Google search, and when I search wearables, it just returned a bunch of Fitbits, uh, VR headsets, which is not what I was looking for. So I did a little bit more digging. I found a lot of images on Pinterest that attracted me. For example, this dress by Cute Circuit, who, uh, yeah, who displays various lights. Um, Cute Circuit is a brand who has also designed clothing such as the Twitter dress for people like Nicole Scherzinger. Following that, there is also this artist called Anut Weprak who designed this um, spider-like projections using servos and 3D printing to project when people invade her personal space, which I think is very useful. At the same time, fashion technology doesn't have to be electronics on textile or electronics somehow attached to your body. It can also involve the type of technology used to design the material. For example, um, Elias Design create prosthetic covers using CNC milling, laser etching, and 3D printing. So once you're inspired, you're more likely to go and look into it into even more. So one of the things that I did which really helped me um, know a bit more about electronics and coding is by attending events. Um, and at these events, it helps to ask a lot of questions. For example, I think there is a lot of you in this crowd who probably has an un have an understanding of electronics, coding, programming, and hacking. Um, I'm very new to this, so a lot of times when I show up at these events, it helps me to ask questions like, what is this? Can you explain to me how this thing works? And to use terminologies that I can later on look up on the internet. So some places that have been really useful for me to just learn a new skill is forums and chat rooms. So the thing with forums and chat rooms is that it's helpful if you know what to look for, if you know the right terminology, in which my case, I often don't know what to look for. So I turn to social media. With social media nowadays, it's very easy to just take a photo of your problem. Like if I build something and there's white smoke coming out of it, I'm just like, white smoke? You know, searching on the internet, but that's not helpful. If I take an image of exactly the problem and upload it on Twitter, I can get so many people to just help me, just using hashtags like makers help or things like that. If I can't find a specific person to help me, people can share it. They can retweet it. They can tag someone else who might know better. And lastly, what really helped me was customer services. Um, there is a lot of customer services online, such as platforms like Twitter. For some reason, these guys, they don't sleep. They have um, the person behind the... Um, account is usually just a regular person, you know, checking their Twitter all the time, or they have it on their phone, so when it beeps, they can immediately answer your question. Again, if they are not able to directly help you, they would know of someone who's specialized to do so. So, another thing that was really helpful in learning a new skill is to try kits. And you can, there are so many kits out there that can be specified to so many different things. There are kits that are specifically for 
basic electronics, how to light an LED. There are kits for soldering, there are kits for combining um, cardboard craft with electronics, and kits for programming. So here is an example of um, one of the kits that I've designed, which involves soldering wires together, because I realized that most kits that teach soldering is to teach you how to solder a, a flat, something flat, or like a flat PCB. So through this kit, um, to answer a lot of questions when people ask how, do, how can kids get started, how can they create um, accessories that um, reflect the aesthetic, this is something that I created to show that. Um, on top of that, you know, when you, go, when you buy something, there's a, if they have an online page, there's a very good chance that they provide a lot of detail. Otherwise, um, you can also probably find on YouTube a lot of things and a lot of variations from what you've purchased. And so go from there, and that way you can create your own aesthetic. So um, moving on from that, I'm going to teach you how to make human organs. <laughs> so I am doing a PhD uh, that involves growing eyeballs using stem cells. Um, so people ask me, how does that even work? So how to get started? <laughs> So what is tissue engineering? Tissue engineering is the use of a combination of cells, engineering, materials and methods, and suitable growth factors that help you create your ideal organ. The aim of tissue engineering is to create an organ that's personalized to you, that will overcome any need for organ donors and overcome problems like organ rejection. So how can we do this? So first of all, we need stem cells. We would get these stem cells from patients who want to grow their own organs. Secondly, we need scaffolds. What are scaffolds? Um, scaffold is basically the house that the cells can attach to in order for it to grow. Other things that will be needed is growth factors. So they're basically food for these cells to survive. Vasculature provides um, a network for delivering this food. What's really important as well is published and unpublished literature. And the reason for this is because um, research is a race against time. If you create something that hasn't been published, you want to put it out as fast as possible. And when someone has published that, and if you are working on the same thing, you want to use that as your stepping stone to push you ahead of that person so that you can publish the next thing. Unpublished literature refers to things like um, collaborations. Lastly, the goal of tissue engineering, again, is to create off-the-shelf organs so that one day you'll be able to go into a shop and be like, you know, pick and mix. I want a little bit of this, I want a little bit of that, and I like to put all of that in my liver because I'm a heavy drinker. That sort of thing. So, to give you an idea, what are stem cells? So, stem cells can come from any part of the body. Stem cells are basically the baby cells that create an embryo. So, in the early days, stem cells were harvested from embryos. Right now, we can obtain stem cells from just a simple skin biopsy of a patient. So this is very non-invasive. Using a simple skin biopsy, we then give it a lot of growth factors to make it think that it is in an embryonic uh, environment. When it thinks it's in that environment, they then go back against time and reverse their age. So from a mature brain cell, a mature lung cell, a mature heart cell, they go back against time and become an embryonic stem cell. So using this embryonic stem cell, when we study human development, we're able to target what sort of growth factors cause it to develop into a brain, a heart, a lung. We use those same growth factors, apply it to these embryonic stem cells, and we have our organ. But it really isn't that simple, because if you grow a mass of cells, it's probably going to form a tumor. It's not going to form the shape that you want it to. 
So this is where we introduce scaffolds. So this is an image of a decellularized liver and a decellularized large intestine. So decellularization is the process of using various deter detergent and enzymes to strip an organ of its cells and DNA. Once you strip it of all its cells and DNA, it loses the natural pinkness that you normally see and give you this transparent structure. This transparent structure acts just like a scaffolding of a house. When you're building a house, you're going to need scaffolding to hold things up. So this scaffolding, which is the, um, yeah, the, the structure of the house, when you add cells to it, it's like adding bricks to a house. These cells will then specialize into different things, like a living room in a house, for example. And that would be a specialized heart or brain, and so on. Um, so moving on to things like um, Sci-Hub, what is it? So there is a lot of people out there who are not, you know, subscribed to various journals and also um, a lot of these journals are only accessible to people who are in academia. And I don't think that should be the case, you know, like nowadays, it's so easy for us to find information, but we do want to be well informed and not just reading off some news which is not properly cited or referenced. So Sci-Hub is a place where people go to get these journals free. So there is so it, there's a couple of issues with this website, you know, legal issues and things like that, but various more have popped up. So if you want to be well informed, just look up a very good journal, a very good review, and from that, it, a good review will teach you everything from scratch. You don't have to be an expert in order to get started. Yeah. So that's it for you guys. If you want to go home and create your own organs, all you need is a scaffold, some of your own stem cells, just a simple skin biopsy. <laughs> um, and then you're basically ready to go. You also need a bit of some financial help, but yeah, figure that out. <laughs> so just to sum everything together, I like to talk about the obstacles and lessons I've learned um, through making. So how many of you have heard this phrase? There are no more original ideas. It's been said so many times and I've heard it more and more recently just because, you know, the internet is so accessible. It's so easy to find something that you've made that looks similar to something someone else has made. Does that actually make your idea unoriginal? I don't believe so, because ideas stem from problems. It is, we are a lot more related than we think. We have a lot of the same problems. If you have the same problems, you're probably going to come up with the same ideas. Again, that doesn't mean that your idea is unoriginal. No one's going to say, hey, you copied my problem. So your ideas are yours. Your ideas can be similar to someone else, but they are original. But if you do look up, you know, like how to solve a problem, and then if that thing inspired you to create something of yours, it is important, very, very important, to credit where credit is due. So one of the first things you can do when you want to credit someone is to ask, ask how they would like to be credited. Because some people, they don't like to be credited. They're just like, oh, okay, you know, I just put this up and I just want to stay anonymous. So that's really important. And more importantly, you should ask whether it's okay to use whatever it is or to share whatever it is that you want to share that belongs to someone else. Secondly, inform them where you're going to use it. Just because, you know, just because you credit someone, it's not okay for that person to turn up somewhere and realize that their, you know, their information is just everywhere and they don't know where it's been said. So that's really important. Secondly, I think it's really, really important to say thanks. You know, 
Because when you do, um, and when you do say thanks to someone for their idea, it really encourages them to do some more, to want to contribute some more to the information that is already readily available. Lastly, when you say thank you to you know, someone who perhaps created something, they are selling it, but it inspired you to go and make your own, do say thanks because it encourages um, and promotes small businesses, which with, again, with the age of internet can really struggle because it's so easy to go and make your own thing rather to purchase something an artist has made. So, I get this question a lot, so I like to address it. A lot of people ask me, you know, I do stem cell research. Why am I doing fashion technology at the same time? It's completely different. You know, growing eyeballs and necks, blinding people with lots of lights. So, I do this because I'm trying to live the best life that I can. And I say this because this used to be my life. You know, there, I think a lot of you here, you love your work. And like me, I feel very thankful to be doing something that is work, but I am passionate about. But the thing is that for a lot of us, well, myself specifically, speaking from experience, I loved it so much that I didn't think I need anything else. I was like, you know, like this, I'm doing life-changing research. Like, none, no other of my needs actually matter. Um, and when you're so passionate about something, it's very, very easy to neglect all your other needs. So I um, suffer from burnout over something that I love. I also had severe anxiety and depression, and I had no idea where they came from. So being the scientist that I am, I did quite a bit of research <laughs> into mental health, which is also work, by the way. Um, and then I found out that life requires balance. You know, you think you might not need it, but it makes life so much more colorful. I, after a full day of work, I go home, and I'm like, oh my god, I have this idea I want to make. You know, I'm not going home like, oh, I'm so tired. You know, I have a really long day. No, I'm going home, I'm skipping home. I'm like, yes, you know, I have this idea. I want to make it real. And this is why I've incorporated making into my life and why I think it's very important. And I think that brings me to the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Time, time okay, yeah, sure. Uh, does anyone want to ask any questions? I think that's okay. Yeah. Oh. I can repeat that. Oh. <laughs> How far have you got in making the eyeballs? We are actually making them right now. Um, in terms of growing eyeballs, it's quite special because they are, they don't require a scaffold. If you grow them in, an, in the right environment, it forms its own optic vesicles. So from a mass of cells, it starts to invaginate and form a little ball. <laughs> so eyes are pretty special. We are already there. We're just trying to make sure that the cells we're working with are functional. <laughs> Any more questions? This one there. Um, great talk, by the way. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, I think I saw that you sell kits online. Yes. Um, how easy is it to run a business as well as doing your making and your PhD work? And is it, um, is it worthwhile? Is it sustainable? And, and is, yeah, what's, what's that kind of side of it like? Okay. Um, yes, I am. So uh, as I said earlier, I, I'm selling those kits, uh, which helps you create, is this light up? <laughs> it's meant to light up, but uh, it helps you create one of these little cat ears. Um, Yes, I do run a business. It is tough because it's just me. 
So I am the marketing, the packaging, the posting, the everything, the design and all that is just me. Um, it can be difficult, but with everything being online, it's a lot easier. You don't have to have a, a proper shop. You know, when orders come in, you can just say that everything's going out on this specific day. And people are willing to wait for your product if it's something that they really want. Um, and just so you know, there is a cyberpunk marketplace later on in the evening, and I will also have a shop there, so if you guys would like to check it out. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Hi. Um, how close are you to actually implanting the eyeballs in people? Uh, it's actually happening right now. A lot of the uh, research with tissue engineering um, a lot of times it is happening to patients who are in extreme circumstances. So it is a trial, but it has been very successful. So for my masters, uh, my lab and I created a tissue engineered oesophagus, which is the track that allows you to um, take food. And it has been published um, and the follow up of the patient is very successful. Um, and this patient is a child. So we were amazed to see that the transplanted organ was growing with the child. Yeah. All right, uh, this question. <laughs> Do you think there'll be a point in the future where your hobby crosses over with your career and you kind of have like technology incorporated into the organs? Um, it is. I do get that question a lot, and I don't really want them to cross. <laughs> like, it is sort of the main reason why I'm doing two very different things. Um, yeah, I do get that question a lot, and there's a possibility that um, the fashion tech side of things might actually grow bigger, and that might become part of my career. And so I will have to find a way to build my own lab to grow my own organs, I guess. <laughs> Okay, so uh, should the problem why uh, organ is being replaced, if it's genetic, uh, wouldn't uh, the replacement organ also be prone to the same problem? Um, the answer is no. Uh, so, so, as we know, the problem with um, organ donors is not only because there is, it's very limited, um, there's, very, there's a very long queue for organ donors, you know, and it's also very limited in the sense that you have to match your DNA. Um, so the, the reason why we are engineering organs in the lab is because when you strip an organ, like, so we can use scaffolds from animal organs or an organ that is no longer fresh, freshly harvested from a cadaver. Um, these organs are stripped off its cells and DNA. So the remaining extracellular matrix is just a matrix that has no um, properties that would cause organ rejection. So when we see these, this extracellular matrix with the patient's own cells, we are essentially growing the patient's own organ. Yeah, that's what I meant. Like uh, if the patient is predisposed genetically to a disorder, would that same disorder be in the uh, like, grown organ? Yeah, so this is where gene editing comes in. So one of the things that I do in my lab is gene editing because we have, um, so I have patients with congenital blindness. So in order for us to address this issue and to grow their own eyes, we have to firstly correct it by using uh, CRISPR-Cas9, which is a, a gene editing tool. Um, and through that, we try to correct that, um, that gene that is producing the wrong thing. Uh, and through that, once it's corrected, we again have to test whether the cells work functionally, whether the eye cells can detect light, and then before transplanting, and yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Hi. Um, I want to sit down so people can't see me. Um, obviously you've talked, you talked earlier about pick and mix um, and just now with gene engineering, so how do you address the morality of custom building organs? 
and potentially people being able to custom build characteristics that they particularly want within their stem cell organs. Hello, hello, here we go. Hi, yeah, sorry about the technical issue. Um, so, in terms of pick and mix, we would ideally like to change certain things depending on the lifestyle of the patient. So, uh, and we would change that in terms of growth factors. So, we would actually have to study uh, it better in terms of human development. I hope that answers the question. We can speak more. Thank you, everyone.